part of the history of this film actually deals with this theater, if I'm not mistaken. If you would sort of take a moment and just explain the Boulder Theater's part in the making of this film. I have to say I'm very emotional at the moment just being here in this theater because it was nine years ago that I was last at, uh, at BIF. Um, I had a short documentary in, in, the, in the program that year, uh, 2007. And I had this little dream in my mind because I'd just read Gene Cernan's book and I thought, wouldn't it make a fantastic movie? Um, and I was sitting there looking at a, a, a tremendous space documentary that was released that year, uh, In the Shadow of the Moon. Uh, some of you might remember it. And I was, I was just sitting there dreaming, oh, God, wouldn't it be great if I could just bring the last man on the move back here? And here we are tonight. And it, it just means so much to me to be here with you and with him. And uh, thank you. Gene, I want to start with you and ask a very important question that I know is on the minds of everyone here. Did you really drink Tang? <laughs> yeah, I, I think so. I'm not sure at this point. <laughs> can, can I say one word? I, I tell you, this is such an overwhelming reception. Uh, you, you're blowing me away. Never did I have, I didn't know Mark had that dream, by the way, but uh, never would I have ever believed we'd be sitting on this, stand, on this stage, uh, having seen what Mark and his teammates had produced. Uh, let me say this. It's, it's a story, if you look at it very closely, it's not about me. It's about your kids, your grandkids, and theirs. It's about a young boy with a dream way back during World War II. Uh, from any town USA, a dream about becoming a naval aviator. Uh, a dream that was so far out of reach and over the horizon, it, it was never even near conceivably possible. But it happened. With little help from mom and dad, I got the education they never had a chance to get. Grandparents were immigrants from, quote, the old country. And that young kid from any town USA became one of those American dreams as he zigzagged through his life, uh, living through the pearls and disappointments and the ticker tape parades to eventually be able to call the moon a home. Fate, fate plays many interesting not tricks but fate has a great deal to do with what each of us accomplish through life and uh, I, I, I am blessed truly blessed to have had the opportunities I've had and now my goal in life is to leave those young kids out there uh, with a little passion and with a little inspiration to once again go where humans have never been before. God bless you all for coming. Baldy, I know that you enjoy being this man's wingman for how many years now? Too many. <laughs> <laughs> About 60 years almost. What? <laughs> Do, I have? Do I have to keep telling you? How come you always got to be in charge? There's a couple flaws in the movie that I'd like to point out. <laughs> Didn't expect Martin and Lewis up here, did you? Go ahead. No, Gene and I go back a long, long way, as you can, uh, as you, uh, can uh, determine from the movie. We met our first cruise on the old USS Shangri-La, and uh, he talks about fate. Well, my good fortune was that uh, my life crossed his. And we've been friends forever and shared a lot of things. One thing I really want the audience here tonight to know, that uh, when we enshrined Gene into the National Aviation Hall of Fame, uh, I don't remember the year, it's been a, quite a few now, but uh, I flew in Vietnam and one of Gene's hangups was, and still is today, and Gene, I said it in front of the National Aviation Hall of Fame audience and I'm going to tell everybody here tonight again. 
His hang up is that he didn't fly and fight in the Vietnam War. And regardless of how many times that I've tried to tell people and tell him, he doesn't listen a lot, he stepped out and did something for our country, for our Navy, that none of the rest of us could have. And he felt that he went away from the squadrons and the air wings that were over in Vietnam, and he felt he let us down. Gene, I want to tell you face to face again, you've never let anybody down, and I love you. So, those are big words from a guy who was shot down twice in Vietnam within 30 days and is on this stage with us tonight. God bless you, my friend. Gene, did it bother you that on Apollo 17, that of the three crew members, you were the only one who had been in space before? That these guys were rookies sitting next to you? Yeah. They, they were rookies. Uh, yeah, they were rookies, uh, like Baldy was when he first joined the squadron. Say, uh, and uh, but one was a naval aviator, so that made a big difference. And he was also a Vietnam veteran. That was Ron Evans. Uh, and as you saw, my uh, lunar module pilot, the guy I walked on the moon with, was not an aviator. He never flew in an airplane. I don't believe before we ever started training. Uh, he was a geologist and a, a lunar geologist and a doggone good one, as a matter of fact. Uh, quite frankly, two things. Number one, I fought, I fought him being on the crew because uh, it just, I, the guy that I had trained with previously he was an X-15 pilot, pretty doggone good guy as well. Uh, but in retrospect, uh, uh, it was the right decision because Jack, was a very detailed geologist, and, and this was the last lunar flight, and not to have given him a chance to be in what I call his own private test tube would have been really a crime. And I was one of those guys that stood back, and uh, I never would have found the orange soil. And I stood back and looked at the mountains and wondered, how, how did they get, get here? What happened? Volcanoes, meteors, what, what, what really went on and between the two of us? We ended up painting what the, the, the geologists, the scientists, thought was a pretty good picture of, of the moon. So I'm, I'm, I'm pretty proud of that. Uh, we're going to try to maybe take a couple of questions quickly. If uh, you want to maybe just come to the microphone, we'll come to you here in just a second. But Mark, let me ask you a question. You know, when uh, we landed on the moon in 69 with 11, uh, there was this uh, statement that, you know, we did it. The word we, that the whole world as one. It wasn't just the Americans. And as a man from the UK who's directed this film about something that came from the United States but was felt globally, if you could give us your impressions of being a British man making this film about something that happened in the US but affected us globally. Well, I, I'm old enough to remember that first landing because my dad, like so many other dads, you know, and mums, took their kids out into the garden and pointed up at the moon, and I, I can see it so clearly today. You know, son, there are men up there on the moon now. And it made a big impression of me, and I think it just stuck with me all these years. Um, and, and it did feel like it was just the biggest deal you could ever imagine. And, and, and what possible future lay ahead for us when we grew up was, was just limited only by our imagination. Um, and w one of my favorite lines uh, in, the moon, uh, in the movie is when Gene, quite unprompted, says, you know, it was America that was going to the moon, but the fact of life was it was 20th century humanity that was going to the moon. The whole world was on that spacecraft with us. And um, I love that line, and, and especially when you see a shot of planet Earth. One of the biggest challenges I had at the time was, was to think, well, what, what possible bit of music could be used that somehow underscores that. Um, and it was actually my next door neighbor that, that, that highlighted me to a wonderful composer, um, Eric Whitaker. 
And a few years back, he, he scored this piece of music, this a cappella <laughs> virtual choir, in which voices from about, I think about 280 voices from around the world all just sang this kind of their vocal part and he put it all together. Uh, and it's a beautiful piece of music, uh, Luxa Rumke. And when that scene is playing, I just hear all those voices from around the world just propelling Apollo 10 to, towards the moon. Uh, um, that's, that's what I think when I see that film anyway. Um, Can but I add anyway. Something? Absolutely. Uh, you know, Apollo 11 and Apollo 13, uh, everybody watched, everybody in the world knew what was happening. Everybody watched Neil take that giant leap from Ancon. And during Apollo 13, I've got to believe that every human being in the entire world, because I've had too much response from too many of them, was kneeling in their own, in their own personal way and saying a prayer for three human beings, notwithstanding they were Americans, three human beings to come home. That, that was significantly important. The space program has brought the world, and look what we got now, we got an international crew. And when we go to Mars, be an international coup. I'm parochial enough to want the general partner to be a naval aviator. <laughs> <laughs> let, let me say something else about the people. Yeah, we, we, went, we went to the moon. Not just Apollo 17, but everyone who went to the moon, everyone who, who flew the flights beforehand. But we, we didn't go alone, Mark. Everybody... And maybe it's some of you, or your aunts, or your uncles, or whoever. Everybody who put every nut and bolt, every piece of wire in that spacecraft, claimed ownership of that spacecraft, and indeed was aboard, on board with us. And they guaranteed us, not all personally, but in, we knew it, we felt it. They guaranteed us that their part, their nut, their bolt, their wire, was not going to fail when they gave us, put our own destiny in our own hands, went to the moon. And think of this, folks. We lost a few people, Apollo 1, before we ever got off the ground. But everyone is a testimonial to the American workers' commitment, is a testimonial of what he did. Everyone who went to the moon has come home to talk about it. I'm going to give you a quick couple of seconds to ask your question and make sure it's a question, please. Hurry up. <laughs> yes, it's wonderful to see you, and I want to thank you for what you have done for humanity. Uh, the astronauts are considered to be heroes by many people. Who would you consider to be a modern-day hero? Who's a modern-day hero? All the astronauts are considered heroes. Who's your modern-day hero? Say, Mark. Well, you know, I could come up with uh, people like John Wayne, and he was when he was alive. No, it's not you, Baldy. <laughs> I got to tell you who my modern-day hero is. And you young kids remember this. My dad. My father. Let's come over here. Question quickly. Um, Gene, I just wanted to ask Wally, uh, was it true that... Oh, no, there's a gentleman at the mic behind you. I'm sorry. <laughs> Some of your colleagues, astronauts, have talked about there's a cognitive shift, seeing Earth from space, uh, calling it the overview effect and wondering if that changed you. Could you hear that question? No, I'm, a, I'm a lot stuck. I got these things, but they're not about me. That's OK. Did, did seeing the Earth from the moon give you that cognitive shift that a lot of astronauts have said that they get from being out there and seeing our world so small? You know, kind of like in Apollo 13, where Jim Lovell puts his thumb up. You know, he covers the whole Earth. Did you feel different? Boy, you've asked me uh, a question that I love to answer because uh, the feelings are entrenched within me, yes. Uh, 
I've always said there's two space programs, and I'll try and shorten this, two space programs, uh, one in Earth orbit and one when you go somewhere. And we went somewhere in Apollo 10 and Apollo 17. They're different technologically, philosophically, and for me, spiritually. Not religiously, spiritually. And when you go out that far away from home and you see the world emerge and, 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 and cover the entire window and get smaller and smaller as you head out to the moon, you see from the North Pole to the South Pole, across continents and oceans, and, and on top of that, every 12 hours, you're looking at the other side of the world. It's dynamic, it's alive, it's life. It, it's, it, it, I came to the conclusion on Apollo 10, and I challenged it on Apollo 17, and just reinforced my feelings. The world, this earth, this home of ours is just too beautiful to have happened by accident, period. Quickly. I'd just like to re remind everybody of something else that you told me, which I think is on the same subject, that you wished that if you could just take the world back and stand them on the moon for like 20 minutes and look back at the Earth, that, that there might be a whole lot less fighting and wars and all that kind of stuff. I mean, we do live in troubled times at the moment, and I think a lot of people's perspectives are, you know, like this, and wouldn't, wouldn't it be great if people could just see our planet in a, in a bigger context. Maybe, do you not think that, that when you were there? Yeah, well, I, you just brought up one other thing. I, I gotta say this, because there's someone out there I want to introduce. Uh, the name of the movie came from the name of my book, which was published 15 years ago now. Uh, but the movie and the book are really same guy, but they're different. You saw the movie, the book, allows me to take you first person everywhere I have been. You've walked in space with me if you've read the book. You've stood on the moon. You've stood, you, you've, you've sat on God's front porch if you read the book, because I went into it that deeply. And the man who guided me through and helped me write the book started this whole thing is a gentleman who lives right here in your community, Don Davis. He's a tremendous, great author and a great friend. Don, stand up. Stand up, Don. Stand up. All of us won't be able to be with you next week, so I know all of us would want to say happy 82nd birthday to you next Monday. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Hang on. My birthday is four days ahead of his. <laughs> and I'm going to be 81. <laughs> what do you think I am, chopped liver? These guys don't stop. <laughs> they don't you know, stop. Well, actually, I, I, I want to sort of end it, actually, because, uh, you know, you, your last words before you lift it off, let's get this mother out of here, if I remember. But, uh, you know, this is the point where I, you know, would want to say thank you to the person, to the guest of your stature who's here. And I was trying to look for the words, but I couldn't. We have this video that I want to show. Actually, it's only one minute long. Uh, and I didn't find the words as good as this guy who I want to show if you guys would turn around uh, and... Let's let this guy say thank you to you. And last but not least, Captain Cernan, uh, I was overjoyed that this man would be here tonight. Uh, I must say, I was at the launch when Apollo 17 went to the moon. Many of us forget uh, great courage and great Americans at a time of need with our country today. And I do not preach politics or just try to do jokes. But in this man, I take exception because he is a delightful, wonderful, great hero. And I must tell you, ladies and gentlemen, to see that rocket take off from the launch pad and to be with his family and his dear ones and to watch this great, wonderful human being call me the night before and say, hey, Don, uh, we're, we're going to go to the moon. Listen, why don't you go over to the Tiki Club or what have you with the wife and have a couple of drinks and boom, boom, boom. It was so casual and so beautiful that I just stood in awe and I was mesmerized by this great hero. I say to all of you Americans, and not to embarrass you, Gene, I thank you for being here tonight. Most important, these are all performers, but you are really outstanding gentlemen. I thank you for coming. Captain Smith.
Ladies and gentlemen, help me say thank you again to director Mark Craig, Fred Baldy Baldwin, and the captain himself, Captain Eugene Cernan.